So we're doing this, we're doing this series, as you know, Relationship Rescue. And two weeks ago, we talked about, um, or, or uh, let's see here, was that right? Last week, we talked about all of the different um, styles of communication that people have. So we talked about a passive style. We talked about a, an aggressive style. We talked about a passive aggressive style. And we talked about an assertive style. And so one of the things that is gonna come out of the fact that all of us are wired differently is gonna be conflict. You know, like the reasons that we have conflict with other people, there's a million of them. One of them is their style of the way they talk and the way they, they try to bring stuff to us is so different from ours that we have trouble understanding, you know, what they're saying simply by the way they're talking about it. That's true for some of us. It's true for some of us that we struggle with certain people because they remind you of somebody else in your life, amen? They remind you of your mom. They remind you of your dad. Maybe your relationship with your dad wasn't positive and you meet this guy and he reminds you of your dad. They remind you of your brother. They remind you of your sister. They remind you of your ex-boyfriend or your ex-girlfriend or they remind you of... Um, they remind you of your ex-wife or your ex-husband, or they remind you of something that really gets on your nerves about your kids, or they remind you of someone that you feel like you, have, you let down somewhere in your life. And so when they start to talk, that's just sort of, and the certain things that they say get into you and they begin to affect you. And so we're gonna talk about tonight, like what do you do with that inevitable conflict? Sometimes, Conflict comes because um, of stuff that's gone on in us from even farther back in our development, and that has to do with schemas. I keep talking about those, and next week, we, I think it's next week, we'll get into those more, more directly. And they, those sort of uh, triggers that come out of um, past history in our lives or places where there's been a, um, an emptiness or a deficiency, those also cause um, conflict events to occur. And so what do you do when that starts to happen? What do you do when the person you're talking to, like you know how it is, right? It can even be somebody at work. You can just feel it. And you can feel that the longer they talk, um, the more agitated, the longer they talk, the more agitated you become. It's like, it's like for yours truly, my favorite of favorites has got to be being on the phone with a customer service individual, right? I mean, I love the experience because what, what it, I mean, I'm gonna, I will listen for a while and we will be getting nowhere together. And then I will say, listen, let me ask you a question. Are you just reading from, are, are you just reading from a script right now? Like, are you going through a set of computer screens, reading what you're supposed to say, regardless of whatever it is we're talking about? And sometimes they'll like, oh no, I mean, no, like, I, it's like, the answer to the question mostly is yes, right, in the most cases. And so it's kind of like, you know you're not gonna resolve the issue because there isn't, a, there isn't somebody on the other end who really is gonna, creatively try to figure out how to resolve the issue. So you're just gonna kind of go around and around like that's a thing, you know, that's just a thing. But what do you do, you know, what do you do with situations that cr produce um, anxiety in you simply because of the way somebody is trying to communicate with you? What do you do? And so the thing you do, the thing that helps kind of comes out of, um, it comes out of some of the material that we have used or are using in our anger management class. And it is called taking a, it's called taking a time out. You know, and you might find yourself, you know, you, you find yourself in a pretty intense conversation over the weekend with your daughter. And she's telling you everything you don't want to hear. And you're, telling her everything she doesn't want to hear. And she's getting to the point where she's feeling disrespected. And you're definitely at the point where you're feeling disrespected. And nobody's getting anywhere. Right now, we're on a collision course. And now, the question's going to be, 
Who's gonna do what damage to whom? What bodies are gonna be left out there in the field? And how many days is it gonna take to get things to where somebody's actually listening to somebody else? Right? That's kind of what this is going to look like. And so a timeout hopefully helps us to avoid that kind of head on. And it kind of gives everybody room, opportunity, and space for several things that are productive to sharing and the communication to happen. So what do you do with a timeout? Well, you're in the middle, you're in the middle of this, what's going to become a fracas. And somebody who's got some recovery, probably, otherwise most of us are just not, not gonna be prone to do this, someone's gonna go, time out. You can even do that, you gotta go, I gotta take it. Not you gotta take a time out, not we gotta take a time out, but I gotta, I'm taking a time out, I gotta take a time out. The other person, if they're not familiar with this, they're gonna go, well that's just stupid, why are we taking a time out? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to prove, my, I'm getting ready to prove my point. I'm getting ready to have some battle. Why are we taking a time out now? Well, there are some benefits to not taking a time out. Here are what they are. If you're a drama addict, if you're a rescuer, if you're a codependent who's trying to find some way to make it right, if you are a right fighter and you are looking for the opportunity to win the argument, or to be right, man, this isn't gonna be, this time out thing's not gonna be the all time best, is it? Because it's gonna definitely, it's gonna impact the drama, the drama deal. It's gonna potentially impact the rescuer deal. Codependents are gonna have no fun with it at all because now they are having to stop their little mind, trust me, from worrying at 200 miles an hour going, what am I gonna do, 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 how am I gonna make this right, how am I gonna get them? Mostly what a codependent is thinking, how am I gonna get you to think the way I think so that you will feel better, so that when you feel better, I'll feel better. You follow all that? How am I gonna figure out how to get in your head for you to think what you need to think and feel what you need to feel so that I will feel better about you and when I feel better about you, well then I'll finally, I'll finally be able to go to bed at night feeling okay about me. That's the benefit to no time out. But here are all the benefits to taking a time out. And we're gonna use this, we're gonna use this, uh, this word stop to kind of get into this, so stop. So first of all, take the break. Whatever it is that's going on, however heated it is, however heated it's about to become, however important your next point is, which, you know, like if you're a persuader, you're gonna think your next point is unbelievably important. But the problem is it may be unbelievably important, but the person you're talking to, if they're not listening to you, it's gonna have no bearing on the conversation, amen? Like it can be unbelievably important, but it's gonna have no bearing on how they're seeing what you're talking about because they're not listening. So stop. What do you do when you stop? You begin to work on all the stuff that is happening inside of you. You begin to work on all the stuff that is happening inside of you. What do you stop doing? You stop going, what is she gonna say next that I need to respond to that is gonna give me the advantage in this conversation. You stop trying to go, where is, the, where is the shot in this conversation that's gonna make this happen? You stop saying, what do I gotta do to really make sure that the way I'm seeing this is clear? And you start asking yourself some questions that are entirely different from what's going on with this person. This is some stuff you say to yourself. Do I know why it is that right now, in this talk I'm having with him or her, I'm, I'm developing an agitation about the conversation. Do I know what it is that's causing me to feel the way I'm feeling right now? Am I even aware of it? Am I even aware of where all the energy is coming from? My mom used to, I've told you before, this before, but my mom, the way she used to do it, this stop thing, she would take her hands and she would put them on your face 
And she would say something like, just tell me everything about it. And man, it was, a, it, was a ma- it was like a magic trick of hers. I mean, like, I don't care how close I was to wanting to kill my sister or one of them, my mom putting her hands on your face was wildly disarming. And she would just go, now listen, just tell me all about it. And, and what would happen is, you would, you, would start, you would start off with her and you would begin to explain to her the validity of why you were entirely right and why your sister in that case was entirely wrong. And so I would tell my mom, I would give my, make, make my point to my mom what she did and she said and she should have and all that and my mom would go, I should have I known all this but she was so much more than me. She would go, I'm sure you felt that way. Notice she did not say it was that way. She did not say your sister was entirely wrong and is a screwed up individual and deserves to burn in hell. She didn't say that. She just said, I'm sure you felt that way. And when you got that out, then she would say something like, well, tell me more. And then she would eventually get to this point of going, well, how, what do you think makes you feel that way? And see, like all that is what is going on when we get hold of this understanding of how is it creative and how is it beneficial to stop and to begin to go, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling right now? What did I bring into this conversation today where there was like, a, um, I don't even know if there's a word like this, but like a, a pre-agitative state. You know, do you know what I mean? Like a pre-agitative state. Have you ever been in a pre-agitative state? It's like the state of mind when you come home from work or you come home from wherever and you're already kind of looking, you're looking for a deal. And the next person that picks up the phone, they're going to get that from you, right? They, they have really have nothing to do with it, but they're going to get that from you. And then they're going to get their own off of that. And then you're going to get even more jacked up because that's how it's going to go. And when you stop, you kind of go, man, you know what? I can just tell right now, this is not, I'm not going to have a good conversation with you. And I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back from this and I'm gonna call you back in an hour. Now see, like, one of the deals of this process of handling conflict is, look, you really do gotta call somebody back in an hour. You can't just go, you can't go, well, we're just, I just don't wanna talk about this. Well, when do you wanna talk about this? Never, <laughs> never. It's like, you gotta be able to go, we're gonna talk about it in an hour, we're gonna talk if it's later at night, we're gonna talk about it the first thing in the morning, but you're gonna make an appointment to talk about what it is that you need to talk about after you've, after you've put this time out into play. So you stop and you assess what's going on with me inside, how did I get here, what is the fuel for why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling, what is the history of this, Who does this what does this conversation remind me of, or in other words, like, where is this, Where is this triggering me? Then the second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take a break. You're gonna take a break from your brain and you're gonna listen hard to your heart. You're gonna take a break from your brain and your thoughts and you're gonna listen hard to your heart. You're gonna take a break and do something different. Maybe you're gonna do something physical. Maybe you're gonna take a break and you're gonna go for a walk. Maybe you're gonna take a break and you're gonna go for a bike ride. Maybe you're gonna take a break and you're gonna um, go cut the grass. Like you won't be doing that right now because it's like 11 degrees, but pretty soon you will be. Maybe you're gonna go cut the grass. Maybe there's a million things you could do. There's a million things you could do. You're gonna go work on some kind of a little physical project. You're gonna, um, you're gonna vacuum. Maybe you're gonna vacuum. You know, I don't know what you like doing, Personally, I like vacuuming pretty well, but I mean, you're, you're gonna do something. Take a break and maybe do something physical. Maybe attend to some need that you have. Maybe you're hungry. You know, you're gonna do something about that. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you haven't had enough water that day, you're gonna do something about that. Take a break. Three, you're gonna observe yourself. Now that I've stepped back from this, 
now that I've taken care of some of my physical needs, now that I've stepped back and asked myself some questions about the origins of why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling, because now I'm realizing, you know what? With him, every single time I'm with him, I feel that way. Every single time he walks into my office, every single time he walks into the kitchen, every single time I see him out, every single time I'm with her, every single time you know we're at work together and they come in the room, man, I feel that. Why do I feel that? I'm gonna observe, is this, with this person, a pattern? Like, is this, with this person, a pattern? Is it not true that when you, you think of the people that you regularly get into conflict with, you're almost believing that you're prepared for battle with them. Am I right? Like if it's someone you just really don't like, like you know what they're going to say because you just, you think you know them because they're a, an opponent and you know what you're going to say. When they say this, you say this. And when they do this, you do this. And they're always going to hang up first or you're always going to hang up first. And they're always going to say this. And then you're always going to say that. And all that's kind of like a dance that we do. But tell me it's not true that it's much harder when we're talking about someone that you're not used to being in conflict with, that you're used to getting along with pretty well, and out of the blue, something starts to happen with the two of you, and man, you are really surprised. That's a great time for a timeout. That's a great time for a timeout. To take a step back, take care of yourself, and then observe, why do I think this is happening right now? Is this coming from anywhere else in my life? Is there something else that went off a couple of days ago that is really making me respond this way? That now now I'm doing this sort of generic everything, everyone. You know, it's like I had this one thing happen to me and it really wasn't very positive with this person over here and that happened like last Sunday. But now I'm carrying around the negativity of that and now, despite who I'm gonna talk to next, I'm gonna feel like everyone in my life lets me down. Everyone in my life disappoints me. Everyone in my life is now disagreeing with me. No one, look at, listen to all those generic terms. No one, or global, no one understands me ever. No one really gets my point. I never seem to get people to understand me. I never seem to be able to, quote, get my way. And I'm really a first class victim. And I observe when I observe those feelings and I go, can it be true that the whole world, the entire world disagrees with me? Can, can it be true that the whole world thinks I'm unimportant? Can it be true that the whole world doesn't take me seriously? Can it be true that the whole world, the whole world, everyone in it doesn't care about what I think? Or do I find myself in this one situation with this one person that has got a lot of things that were front loaded into it, which is usually true, and now we're in this battle together, and now I have a choice to make, and that is, am I gonna stop? Am I gonna stop and unravel this? Or am I gonna continue and spin it up? What am I gonna do? Observing is a part of that unraveling process. And then four, I'm gonna proceed, the P, I'm gonna proceed mindfully. The next thing I say, I'm gonna really think about how to talk about that. So what I'm probably gonna do, what I'm probably gonna do is I'm probably gonna start the next thing I'm gonna say with something about me, and I'll get into that in a second, and how I feel. So start with the timeout. Maybe start with an hour, do something physical, and when you return, think hard about starting with your part. When we were talking about this, I was feeling this way. Not, not, which this will continue, if you wanna continue the conflict, here's the way you say it. When we were talking about that, I need you to know the way you made me feel. And you made me feel exactly like this. And that's the way you made me feel. And it's your fault and you shouldn't have done that because you were the one that caused that to happen. 
I will guarantee you if you want to accelerate the, the conflict, that's the way to do it. Like that is the way to do it. The way to, uh, the way to spin it down is to go, I want to talk to you about when we were having this conversation, the reason I stopped is because I was getting, I was getting really agitated. And I realized that we weren't going to get anywhere in our conversation because I was feeling myself get agitated. And I was going to lose my perspective. And when we started having this conversation about A, B, C, D, or F, I was feeling like this. I felt like this. And you're using those kinds of direct I statements, which is exactly what we were talking about last week with the person that is using an assertive communication style. We, we tend to, as I was saying last week, most of, us, most of us in the South tend to think that somebody who is assertive is aggressive. Because in the South, we're much more accustomed to being passive than we are, little bless your harders, than we are anything else. You know, it's like, it's like you can almost, it is virtually, not totally, but it is almost impossible to resolve a church conflict in a church in the South because the belief is that since we're in church and we're here with Jesus and stuff, we're not supposed to have any conflict with each other. It's like, well, Jesus, in his three years of doing public ministry, he had a boatload. He had a boatload of direct conversations that created conflicts for people. He had a boatload. But we struggle with that because we, we want to misconstrue someone who's direct with someone who's aggressive. You, if, you go to, uh, if you go to Ohio, you won't see that nearly as much. If you go to New York, you won't see that nearly as much. It's like, it's like I was talking about, I think, last week. You ought to see what it's like, like in, on Hilton Head, you ought to see what it's like when a New Yorker collides with somebody from Augusta, Georgia. <laughs> yeah, you know, like the, supposedly the nicest city in the United States, and I believe it, the nicest city in the United States is Charleston, South Carolina. You agree with that? Yes, sir. The way people are, how much they'll go out of their way to tell you where, you know, where, like give you directions or help you out with where to go eat or whatever. The most genuine, nice people in the United States that keeps winning these awards are people in Charleston, South Carolina. Can you imagine that person in Charleston colliding with a New Jersey person born and raised in New Jersey and what, what might happen? I'm not saying it would happen. I'm just saying what might happen. Man, they, what they would use, the term that they would use in Charleston is they would say, yeah, I met this gentleman this afternoon and I was trying to give him directions and this would be their word. And he got kind of ugly. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I moved to, I moved to uh, Charlotte from Texas. I was telling you guys that last week. It took me about six months to figure, figure out, what do they mean when they're saying someone was acting ugly? <laughs> Like, I don't, I'm not really sure. That was a term I have, ne I have never, I had never heard that term used in Texas anywhere ever, that somebody was acting ugly. They used a lot of other words, but it wasn't ugly. <laughs> wasn't ugly. So when you come back from a timeout, whether it's an hour or an evening or whatever, start with your part. Start with I statements. I feel, this is the way this made me feel, all of that. Second thing, become consistent and adept or used to using boundaries. We've done a class on boundaries. We'll do it again. We did a whole series last spring on boundaries. We went through six weeks of the basics of boundaries. You can look up that series on recoverycoaxberry.com. But I'm going to give you a couple of things that came out of that series that I think are very big deals. Number one, you're responsible for setting a responsible boundary with somebody, not for the reaction of the other person who is receiving it. Like a boundary is a boundary. A boundary isn't a weapon. It's not a tool that's gonna help you to gain advantage over somebody. It's not, it's not, a, manipulative, it's not a manipulative tool. 
It's just sharing with somebody else, this is the truth about what it is that I either can or am willing to do in my relationship with you. And this is what is, this is what I've decided is a safe, healthy place for me to be in a relationship with you. So I'm responsible for that piece of developing a boundary, but I am not responsible, there's the book, I'm not responsible for the reaction of the other. Here's another piece to that for all of us Southern passives. The anger of another person as a result of you talking to them about a boundary for you cannot jump across the room into you. You know, like people can get as angry as they would like with you and they can tell you all about it and all of that is fine, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna cause you to be angry. You can, you can basically go, you know, like obviously you're angry and um, I'm hearing that and, um, you know, duly noted. I mean, you know, thanks for sharing that, but you don't necessarily... You're like, that's crazy, man. I could never do that. You don't necess- You should be in a codependency class and you don't necessarily have to take on their emotions in order for you to be okay. Are you following me? And in that regard, disagreement, conflict and all that, it isn't, there, there's nothing about conflict or disagreement that is inherently bad or negative. Like when people go, when people go, my parents you know, they're about to get married and they're in premarital counseling. And a therapist may ask them, how did your parents deal with conflict? And they go, well, my parents, they never had any conflict. And if I was a therapist, I'd be like, oh crap. I mean, like, they really think that. Like, your parents had plenty of conflict. It's just maybe they didn't talk about it. Maybe they stuffed it. Maybe they zinged each other with it. There are a million things they could have done in their passivity, but they had conflict, right? They had conflict. When people are involved, there's gonna be conflict. That's like a, an axiom. The deal is, though, you're your reaction to something that I'm telling you as a boundary for me is your reaction and your disagreement with me is your disagreement. And if it gets to that, your, your um, anger about that is yours, not mine. I can hear you, understand you and appreciate what you're saying to me, but I don't have to take it on me. Do you follow that? Boundaries create for us safety. They create for us honesty and they create accountability. I want to go back to something we were doing last week about assertive communicators. It sounds like a lot like what we're talking about tonight. Assertive communicators will state their needs and their wants clearly, appropriately, and respectfully. They will express feelings clearly, appropriately, and respectfully. They will use I statements. They will communicate respect for others. They will listen well without interrupting. They will feel in control of themselves. They will have good eye contact. They will speak in a calm and clear tone of voice. That happens when you've taken a time out. They will have relaxed body posture. They will feel connected to others. They will feel competent and in control of themselves. They will not allow others to abuse or manipulate them and they will stand up for their own rights. Pretty healthy. Most of us are gonna learn that assertive understanding of talking to people and being with people in recovery. I do not think that that style is natural or normative for most of us with no recovery. I think you learn assertive communication by learning the principles of recovery and trusting them over and against the immediate activity that is going on in your life, amen? I mean, what's immediate is right there and it's like right on you and it's like doing this and doing this and doing this and you're taking a step back and you're saying, what is it about this that's going on with me that's going on with me inside? What do I know about myself? What principles am I gonna use to deal with this? And how am I gonna create a safe, calm, 
inviting place for there to be a conversation where everybody's going to benefit. Jesus says it like this. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching or everything somebody else says. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Jesus, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body, people that are like me, people that are not like me, people that agree with me, people that do not agree with me. He will make the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Man, that is worth learning for, isn't it? That right there is worth learning for. What does it mean for me to be, you know, a healthy, a healthy communicator and someone that is able to deal with conflict in my life? I wanna thank you so much for being here tonight. If you wanna talk about this more, um, you can go right out these doors when we finish here in a minute. and. Um, Go to a care room and talk about this some more. We're going to open up this space in front of me during our last song, and you can spend some time um, talking to God about what's going on with you and maybe the person that um, always seems to be your, uh, you know, your nemesis. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.